All right, welcome everyone to the second annual Winterfest. Uh, we're delighted that everyone has come here. We're delighted that we've had strong registration for the session. We had to move it in here from the FITREC, and so thank you for your flexibility. Uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Miller. Uh, she's a distinguished professor of the law school. She's taught there since 1975. Uh, she has many awards and accomplishments. I'll keep it very brief as I promised her and just mention that she's also a trustee of Mount Holyoke College. And that is it. And thank you, Professor Miller, for, <laughs> I promise, I, I, I said it was going to be brief, so. Good. Yeah. I just have to have one more thing. I'm yeah. a trustee of the Joslin Diabetes Center as well, and we just named a new president yesterday. And if you missed it in the Globe yesterday, uh, just take a look. We are just totally thrilled. Uh, we got the, the Ranch Kimball, the former uh, 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 Secretary of uh, Economic Development for the Commonwealth has come to uh, to it. For those of you who know what's happening in diabetes, uh, or I'm sure someone in this, at least someone in this audience is suffering from diabetes, you know what a tremendous public health problem we have and have brewing here. So we're thrilled. So watch this space and see what happens with respect to uh, diabetes care. Uh, I have 45 minutes to cram God knows what down your, down your throats. I'm gonna do it real fast. Uh, you've got Larry Kotlikoff coming after this with all kinds of more things. But I have five handouts for you. Uh, if you could pull this one, the, the probate process funnel, and pull that one out first. I think that's the, the easiest one to start with. I do not use PowerPoints on purpose because I want you to go home with this. I want you to work with your own uh, thing here so that you'll maybe internalize some of what we're talking about here. And it seemed to me the thing that I could do that would be most helpful for the broadest range of people was to explain to you a little bit about what the probate process is, how it works, why it takes so long, and you know, how, you, how you want to start thinking about your own assets with respect to it. At the end of this, I'm going to give you the most quick and dirty overview of the state and gift taxation you ever had. But the materials I gave you as handouts will go into depth on it. And if any of you have questions after that, uh, if you want to email me, fmiller at bu.edu, uh, I'll see what I can do for you for a quick and dirty <laughs> answer over the email. So fmiller at bu.edu. And again, I apologize for how quickly I'm going to have to go through all of this. But I think with the handouts to follow, uh, it'll be easier than it might have been otherwise. So if you take this one, which I call the funnel, in which my students are very, very accustomed to, uh, this thing tries to tell you what it is that the probate process is about. And hand in hand with this one, the one page sheet that says uh, probate process basics is the other one. I'm gonna be working down this sheet, but this diagram is what I'm gonna be talking about as I work down the sheet. And um, I just wanna start off by saying, when you're the reason I call the probate process a funnel is that when someone dies, you have to, and you have to be thinking about this because regrettably, we all die. And so does everyone we know, and so does everybody in our family. And so you want to be thinking about uh, how you uh, take control of things so that things don't happen to you. You uh, organize things so that what happens is what you want to have happen. You wouldn't be here if you weren't a controlling kind of person. You wouldn't have elected to come here. You would have been passive and sitting back and say, okay, whatever happens, happens. You're not that kind of person by definition because you're here. So if I take this $20 bill out of my wallet, I just want to make a point here. I earned this $20 bill, it's mine. Uh, I have both the legal title to this, I rightfully am holding it, and I own the underlying equity in it. I'm not holding it in trust for someone else. I own it and uh, I own both the legal title, I have the legal title and the underlying equity uh, right there. Now, darn it, I hope, and I probably don't. Yes, I do. 
This is against the fire laws, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, I'm going to uh, take this $1 bill, which I also own the legal and equitable title to because I earned it, and I'm going to put it in trust right now. I hereby declare that I hold this dollar bill in trust for whoever asks me a question in the next 45 minutes that I cannot answer. <laughs> so what I have done is I have taken legal title and split it from equitable title. I, I, I have done what we call, when we're talking about the elements, of, I have the intent, I have the delivery of an existing property interest. This is an existing property interest that I own the underlying legal title to, as well as the underlying equitable title, as well as the legal title. And I have taken it from myself as legal and equitable title owner and transferred it to myself as just the legal title owner. I have, all, I have just by stating it, transferred the underlying equity out there to you. So if, and I do this in class, the beginning of every semester, I put a, I actually, in my class, I put a $20 bill in trust. I tell them, I have now created a trust. All it takes is splitting legal from equitable title, and when it's personal to you, you can do it orally. If it's, really, if it's real estate, you, you have to do it in writing. Obviously, you don't want to do it orally because you've got problems of proof with personal, but you can. Now, in class, I won't do this here, but in class, yeah, I will. I do that, and then I stand here with the $20 bill burning up until somebody <laughs> says to me, you can't do that. And they usually say you can't do it because it's illegal to burn legal tender. I said, yes, that's true, but that's not what I'm talking about. I can't do it because it's not my dollar bill anymore. It's, and again, if someone, at the end of, if nobody asks me a question in 45 minutes that I can't answer, then legal title is going to, and equitable title are going to revert to me. But if someone does, then you know, I just want to tell you that when I did this uh, a few years ago down in Florida, somebody put their hand up in the back row right away and said, what are the radioactive properties of plutonium? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, just, see, I didn't specify what kind of a question. Okay, so what I want to tell you is this is legal and equitable title. When it comes to my, Sorry, where's my, my 20? That equitable title is now yours. I have a duty to make that property productive during the next 45 minutes, but I'm otherwise engaged. This $20 bill is mine. I have both. If I died on the way home from here, this $20 bill would have to come into my probate process because I own both legal and equitable title to this, and it has to go into the probate funnel. So do, and this is what I have at the top of it. If you look, I have houses, stocks, cars, and bank accounts. Can anybody tell me what they all have in common? They all have value. They all have value, but so does this. They have something that this doesn't have. What was that? What kind of title? They have legal title in registered form. This does not have legal title in registered form. But anything that's in a yeah, house, a uh, share of stock, a car, or bank accounts, they are all in registered form. They have to go into the funnel because no one will deal with you with, you know, unless you get a probate court saying you are the person appropriately entitled to this property after the named decedent has died. Let me give you an example. My mother-in-law died uh, quite a few years ago, and when she died, she left a little piece of paper on the table, on the kitchen table, saying, I want my car to go to my son, Hugh, who's my husband, and I want the television set and the rugs to go to my son, Norman. And so we said, fine. And that's pretty much all she had was a car and a television set and a few things. It's like that. So Norman took all the, the television set and the rugs, and my husband took the car. And I drove the car here. I drove it to BU, because I was driving an old rattle trap then. 
So I said, great, I'll drive her car. I drove it, but within a week of driving it here, it got stolen. Guess what? I had to go out and open probate in Springfield. I had to schlep out to Springfield four times to open probate to get the authority to get this sh the check from the insurance company for the value of the, of the car. Because the insurance company isn't going to give my husband uh, the value of a, car, a check for the value of the car because who's my husband? The title in the car said Ruth Miller. It didn't say Hugh Miller. So the insurance company cannot get a release for having paid off on the policy from my husband but because my husband isn't legally authorized to deal with the legal title to that car. So one thing you learn very quickly, if you want to avoid probate, which many people do because it saves money, saves delay, and it's private, is you put that car in joint tenancy so that when someone dies, it, the, the title to the car succeeds by operation of law to the surviving joint tenant rather than gets blocked up in the probate process, forcing you to go and unblock it. Uh, I just, you know, I, that's a little getting ahead of where I want to be right now, but I want to start you thinking about the question of what legal title is. So when someone dies, everything they own has to go through, the, in, at least metaphysically, has to go into the probate process. But particularly, anything where a title is in registered form has to go into the probate process because otherwise you can't get at it. The survivors can't get at it. So let's go back to uh, Roman numeral number two on this probate process basics. So what is probate? It's the court supervised administration of a decedent's assets. Do you have to go to probate? The answer is no. Nobody's going to come and say, hey, uh, you didn't take your father's estate to, to probate. You've got to go to jail or pay a fine. No one's going to say that. You don't have to go. But why do you want to go? Ah, unblock legal title in registered form. If the decedent is the sole owner and the title is in registered form, no survivor can get that asset unless they go get court approval that you're the appropriate person to get that asset. So we talked about the fact cars, houses, securities, bank accounts, all that are, are uh, things where you've got registered form. The second reason why you would want to go is that if anyone owes any debts to the person who's died, they're not going to pay it unless they can get a release from the person to whom they write the check. So if, for example, one of your parents had given a loan to a friend, the friend isn't going to come back and pay it to you because you, you have no authority to give them a release from their debt unless you've been appointed the executor of the state, someone appropriately dealing with your parents' assets. So why do you go unblock legal title, collect any debts that are owed to the decedent? Third, you want to start the statute of limitations running with respect to the person who's died, because that person will have, by definition, most, I shouldn't say every person, but most people will have, at the very least, a phone bill or a light bill, utilities bill, something like that. They'll have some debts that haven't been that haven't been paid. There may be much larger debts there. Well, you want to start the statute of limitations running so that you know what those debts are so that you can pay them off and then distribute whatever is left to the beneficiaries of the decedent's estate. Am I going too fast for people? OK, stick that hand up if you have a question. <coughs> so you want to start that statute of limitations running. Yeah. It's the limitations for you or for them. It's for them, and for the person who's died. And what is the limitation period? It's a short lim limitations period. I should have looked up what Massachusetts is, but it's something like six to, oh, OK. <laughs> you got it. Where is it? 
See, and here I am not even realizing you just asked me a question I can't answer. It is a short period of limitations, okay? Congratulations, well done. But, but you, want to, you, want to, you want to cut that off because obviously you're not going to distribute whatever assets are there. The executor isn't going to distribute whatever assets are there to everybody else and then have a creditor crawl out of the woodwork later and say, hey, there's a student loan here that remains unpaid. And then you sit back and say, wait a minute, I've already distributed it. Well, the administrator or executor will be personally liable if they haven't done the appropriate thing there. Okay, the second thing you want to do, is, the, sorry, the fourth thing, reason you want to go is you want to secure any distributions you do make from attack later. For somebody coming in later and said, hey, wait a minute, that wasn't the right will, there should have been another one. Well, you'll be protected in having used them if you have gone through the probate process. What's the problem with going through probate? First and foremost, the thing people complain the most about is delay. It takes an average of two to four years to close probate, to open and close probate. And people are saying, what are those lawyers doing? Why haven't they given me what my uncle left me? Why does it take so long? Well, the short and the long answer are, first of all, you have to go through all the decedent's papers and find out what they've got, what they owe, where things are. People often squirrel bank accounts away, you know, in weird places, and you only find out at the end of the year when they, when the bank sends you an information return about what the what the uh, the bank account has earned during the year, you only find out then that they had this bank account or something like that. So first of all, you have to find out that takes a long time. And with respect to all of you, you can do your family a big, big favor by having a document that specifies what you have, where it is, what form of legal title you own it, whether it's a joint tenancy with a relative or a friend, or whether it's a sole legal title. Uh, I also, if, if any of you want it, flip me an email and I'll send you back. I have an estate planning questionnaire. It's about 10 pages with the kinds of questions. It's not that every question has to be answered, but it's very useful for structuring your thinking about what it is you do own, and that would include things like life insurance policies, uh, annuities, survivorship with survivorship benefits, all the many, many ways in which people hold property. But if you want uh, that questionnaire, fmiller at bu.edu, I can flip it to you on an email right away and you can uh, do your family a big favor by filling it out. Uh, the second reason you won't, uh, don't you know, the second problem with going to probate is that it's expensive. Usually you have to play, pay the executor administrator or administrator, and if the estate is at all complicated, you have to pay a lawyer as well. So it's expensive. Third, it's very, very public. Uh, I'm the kind of person, because I teach trusts and estates, I haunt websites like Wills of the Rich and Famous. and. The things you can see and find out about the way people's lives are lived are quite astonishing. And, you know, I have Elvis's will, I have JFK's will, I have, you know, just Google wills of the rich and famous and you'll be quite surprised at what you see. I'm sitting here now waiting to get my hands on Gerald Ford's will. <laughs> I have tried in vain to get my hands on Ronald Reagan's will. Uh, either he did some mighty fancy estate planning and avoided probate altogether, or something's very odd going on because it seems not to be out there. But if, you know, Ronald Reagan's will would be extraordinarily good for me for teaching purposes because he's the typical American family. Two children with his first wife, one of whom is adopted, two children with a second wife, neither of whom is adopted, family problems galore all over everywhere, adopted children. The only, the only grandchildren he has are through the adopted child. I'm really interested in how he handled all that. But 
he was very clever with his estate planning. He didn't want people like me knowing, apparently, because he handled all this outside the probate process. So a lot of people don't like being public with what their assets are and what they chose to do with them. Um, OK, so the trick of estate planning is really to go to probate with respect to the excuse me, to avoid probate with respect to the bulk of your assets. Put the bulk of your assets in forms that will pass outside the probate process, but, but then open probate to collect the debts, if there are any, to trigger the non-claim statute, which is what we call this, that short statute of limitations. And, um, yeah, and to just to take care of the odds and ends that you don't have in probate avoidance form. Just uh, for example, let me just tell you about my own father. In this case, the cobbler's child, well, the child of the, the child is the cobbler. Anyway, in this case, we arranged all my father's uh, assets so they either owned them with jo in joint tenancy with my mother or they were life insurance agents. So I never opened probate with him. Never. We just took care of everything. We have a family that is copacetic with respect to how the property was handled, which is basically give it all to my mother. And that was the end of the story. So we never went to probate. And you know, I knew what the tax situation was, so I took care of that. <laughs> it was zero. And <laughs> that, that was no problem. Now, my mother is 93. And uh, we had this discussion yesterday. She owns a little Cape Cod house, and you know she's going to split it between my brother and me, and she has a little bit that sort of keeps her going financially. And I'm a joint tenant with her on, on the stocks and the car and all that kind of stuff, but she still owns the house in her own name. And I've been trying to get her to put it in joint tenancy with my brother and me. I said, Mother, I'm going to have to go open probate for you, and I don't feel like it. You know, I don't want to schlep down to Plymouth County probate court and deal with it that way. If we just put him there, I think she's weakening. <laughs> so I think she's got to do it. Uh, she said, but she's fiercely independent. You know, she just does, you know, just, and she, she's a child of the Depression, and she came out of all that saying, you know, this is mine. I worked hard to get this. And she doesn't want to do it. And, you know, it's a delicate conversation to have, but it's a very smart and strategic thing to do, assuming a family trust one another. You know, if you don't have trust going in the family, forget it. But uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's what I, I'm planning to do. Yes? What's the average cost of probate? Depends on the size of the estate. Uh, geez, I should have another dollar in here. Does Massachusetts have a sliding scale? Yeah, I, what, what I'll tell you that lawyers it's a very interesting question, which segues over into antitrust issues and price fixing. Uh, so lawyers will not tell you there is a set fee because they don't want anyone to think that, is a, that the Bar Association has a fee schedule and we all adhere to it because that would be wrong. It's according to how much work is involved it's in. Not a court cost. Excuse me. It's not a set court cost. Oh, there are court costs. Sure, court costs. Again, that will depend on the size of the state and the complexity of it. Uh, they're not horrendous, but you know it's it's an administrative burden for the court. And uh, yeah, I really should have had another dollar ready here for you, but uh, that's an easy thing to find out. <laughs> but that's an easy thing for you to find out. You can Google it in two seconds, I'm sure. You know, probate cost fees, Massachusetts, bingo, you'll have it. Um, and, and the lawyer's fees will depend on the size and complexity of the estate. But the more you can help the lawyer by, for example, filling out that estate planning questionnaire that I s said you could get from me just by flipping me an email, the more you help the lawyer by doing that, the, more, the cheaper it will be with respect to probate. Yeah? Does life insurance by definition fall outside of the probate? Yes. And one thing I wish I had here, all right, let's pretend this is a blackboard. Um, if, if we have life insurance, I want to explain to you something about it because this is one of your basic probate avoidance uh, devices. You have the insured, oh, kill this. 
oh, it's not, I can't do anything with it. It's like your computer screen. I don't want to hurt it. Uh, so if this said it was insured, I'm writing insured here, and this is your insurer over here, they will enter into a contract, which I would show like this. Uh, this is the insurer. The insurer would make a promise to the insured, and the insured would pay money to the insurer. That's your contract. But that, pro that transaction would spin off a third-party beneficiary contract right, so that the named insured could, by merely presenting the death certificate to the insurance company, get back the face amount of the policy, assuming there were no loans taken out on the policy. So you get basically the contract between insurer and insured spins off during the insured's lifetime this third-party beneficiary contract right. So that transfer is deemed to take place inter vivos rather than as, even though it becomes due only on the event of death, the contract right, the right to the money got spun off during the lifetime. So therefore, it does not have to go into the funnel. OK? Does that make sense? Yeah. You were talking about the uh, having your mom to transfer the house to you and your, and your and my brother. How is that different from just having the house completely just transferred to you and your brother? Very different. Because if she just completely transferred it to me and my brother, then she would have to pay a gift tax on it. Because the value of it, well, she wouldn't have to pay a gift tax. She would have had to report that she'd made a taxable transfer. Two things about, let me just tell you two things about estate and gifts taxation. And here I'm hopping way ahead. But then perhaps the written materials I've given you here will help you figure it out in, in, you know, more specifically later. Hmm. Excuse me. The house, let's just say it's worth $400,000. I don't know what it's worth. Yes, I do know what it's worth. But let's just say it's in the neighborhood of $400,000. Gift tax gives you an annual exclusion, as I'm sure most of you know, from gift taxation of, and I believe it's $11,000, but we just kicked it. Is it now twelve? dollars it kicked in with the two ends of the set. Gives you an annual exclusion of $12,000. So you, you, IRS doesn't care about the first 12000 of that 400 But they do care about the 390 that's left. So you have to file a quarterly return with respect to gift taxation showing that you have made that she has made $390,000 worth of a taxable gift. She does not have to pay a gift tax on it yet because you get a lifetime million dollar exemption from gift tax. So until her cumulative lifetime gifts get more than $1 million, she doesn't actually have to pay a gift tax. But we don't want her to do that. We don't want her to transfer it to us. Because if she transfers her, to her house to us by way of gift, we have to take over her tax basis in that house. She bought that house for $20,000. It's now worth four hundred. dollars We don't want to pay a capital gains tax on the difference between her purchase price and the fair market value. So the rule of thumb you use when you're thinking about making gifts to children, for parents making gifts to children, older people making gifts to younger people, is that you give away as opposed to leave in your estate, you give away your high basis assets, ones where you're, you know, the stocks you bought yesterday. You don't give away your low basis asset, assets like your house that you bought 40 years ago because you, want, you don't want the people who take it to have to pay capital gains tax on all that appreciation. If, on the other hand, you had held, she had held on to, or your parent had held on to that property until they died. When they die, you get a step up in basis to fair market value as of the date of the decedent's death. L let me just show you how I talk to my students about it. I say, when you think about how you should deal with assets that people are trying to 
If, you, if your goal is to minimize estate taxation, for example, or income taxation with respect to having to pay these capital gains, think of it as a, you know, this. If you want the tax advantage, you have to give up control. If you want to keep control, you have to give up the tax advantage. Now, with respect to gifts, you know, and, and that's, you know, I, I don't want to get too complex right now, but let's just leave it with what I told you about before. If you give something away during your lifetime, then you are transferring your cost basis to the donee. If, on the other hand, you hold on to something until you die, your beneficiaries get the benefit of a step up in basis to fair market value as of the date of your death, and nobody ever pays on that appreciation. Right? And some of those assets are joint tenancy, for example, by the Well, you've just told me something that I think is inconsistent. I mean, is inconsistent. If you've got assets in joint tenancy, then they're not in a living test trust. They're either in a trust or they're in joint tenancy. I mean, you could have joint trustees. Uh, you know, if you want to talk to me afterwards, we can get into that a little bit. But, you know, you've given me two things that can't happen together, unless you're telling me the trustees are joint tenants. Yes? Um, if a husband and wife now see the light and decide that their assets are going to be held in their individual names should now be in joint tenancy, does that trigger an estate or a gift tax? No, because there is a, an estate. A, you know, we call estate and gift taxation together, we call transfer tax. There is a transfer tax wash for gifts between husband and wife. A reason to be married. Yes? I'm going to give you the lawyer's answer. That depends. OK? And the lawyer's answer is always, I, I teach my students this all that. I said, never give someone a, you know, a flat out answer to a question when they ask something like that, because it all depends on what the underlying facts are. So you know, do you mind if I leave it at that? I mean, it can be. You talking about an older person like being a joint tenant on a car with an elderly parent? Or any, any situation, say the child, the child and the parent and child have the, an asset in the parent's life that's going to go to the child and the child. Any, any problem? Yeah, well, it, 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 it's possible. But it will be depend on what the other person knew, should have known, and lots of other things as well. You know, if you've got a kid that you know is accident prone, irresponsible, reckless, so forth and so on, then, you know, it begins to look more and more like that. Okay. Quick question. Yeah. Uh, for joint ownership, even a husband and wife should, if they have expensive cars, should have it, the title in both names? No, no, I'm going to give you the lawyer's answer. That depends. <laughs> My husband and I, excuse me? To avoid that asset from a probate, you should have that automobile Okay, well, let me give you two things. First of all, is there a business reason for it to be in the second, in one name or the other? For example, my husband and I have our cars in our, each in our own names, even though either one of us could kick any second. Uh, but they, we have an own, because we both file Schedule C income tax returns and we expense the cars as a business. So, you know, you have to sit there and you say, well, which is, where is it worth more? Uh, you know, as you grow older, sure. But what are the odds that they'll die together? You know, if they're going to die in an automobile accident, you may have them both dead. You know, I often, I often counsel to do it with a child, if you trust the child. If it's going to go to the child anyway, I counsel that rather than the spouse. But depends. Yes? Oh, 
Okay, we're skipping way, way ahead in the tax stuff. I'm, I'm sitting here looking at this. I assume I should stop at, since we started five minutes late, we should stop at 10 minutes of. So, okay, let me just do one thing on this and then I'll get to that. Okay, because I want, since you all seem to be pretty sophisticated from the kinds of questions you're asking, I'm gonna go right into the tax stuff. And, but let me just finish one thing. Uh, so you get the basics about this probate process fund. You get what goes in here. I just want to say what comes off are the debts the decedent owned, what comes off are any taxes due on the estate, and that's your net probate estate if there are any uh, statutory for share, you know, spousal claims against it or omitted children claims, they come out of it. And then at the bottom of the funnel, the assets get spewed out either to the beneficiaries of the will if the decedent died with a will or the beneficiaries under the intestacy, the local intestacy statute if the decedent did not die with a will. So, you know, it goes either one way or the other. That's how the probate process works. Now, I said, I said, what's the problem with going? You know, we talked about what the problems with going to probate are. And then I said, the trick is to avoid probate with respect to the bulk of your assets through the use of uh, these most common forms of probate avoidance. And that's down at the bottom. That A should be out at the side there. Um, insurance payable, life insurance payable to anybody but the estate. We've already talked about why life insurance does not go into the probate funnel. Because the theory is that contract right to the proceeds passed during your lifetime, it just became, it turned into money when, you, when the insured died. But that right to demand the money passed during lifetime, so it doesn't have to go into the funnel. It will, however, count for your, for your estate tax bill unless you took certain steps with it, and I'll be with that in a minute. Uh, any assets that you put in a trust are not part of your funnel because legal title has passed. I'm talking about setting up a trust during your lifetime. If you set up a trust during your lifetime, legal, legal title to those assets is passed already to the trustee during your lifetime. You don't have legal title anymore, so therefore it doesn't have to go into the funnel. And uh, the, last, uh, the last way to avoid probate, of course, is to give it away now. And a lot of people do do that with their high basis assets, not their low basis assets. So those are the, those are the ways to avoid probate. Now, as I said, you seem to be pretty sophisticated on the um, uh, Roger, can I, can I have the, the, uh, the one page thing, it's, or the, it's probably two pages on transfer taxation, the estate tax one, not the one that says annual exclusion and gift. Or can I borrow yours for a sec? Yeah, basic estate taxation. And this will get to your question, I hope, with respect to that. If you want to talk about estate taxation, this one, yeah, thanks. I need to tell you two things first. We talked just briefly about gift taxation and the fact that you can give away $12,000 a year per donee per year and the IRS doesn't even care about it. They don't even want to know about it. I could, if I had it, I could give every one of you $12,000 give every student in my class, give every person at BU $12,000, and the IRS would say, ho oh, huh. They don't care. In fact, they like it, because I'm accomplishing part of what the estate tax is designed to do, which is wealth redistribution. So they're fine. But the minute I go over $12,000 for any one donee in a year, then I have to report the gift to the IRS. And then I start eating away at my million dollar exemption equivalent from gift tax. But your exemption equivalent from estate tax this year is two million. 
So I, I, uh, what I do when I, with my students, I come into the class with boxes. And I say, OK, if I give away in year one, let's just say I give away in year one $500,000 or $512,000. I have to report that $500,000 gift to the IRS. Then in year two, I give $510,000 to somebody else. OK, I have to report that to the IRS. I'm now at the $1 million level of taxable gifts. I still haven't paid a tax yet. If I then die leaving a $1 million, that has to go up here so that I am now at the $2 million level, taking into consideration my lifetime gifts and what I leave at death. I still don't have to pay any tax because I have a $2 million exemption equivalent from estate and gift taxation. But if that had been instead of $1 million at my death left, it had been two or one and a half, I would have had to pay tax on the difference between, you know, on the 500000 above $2 million. Okay? All right, that's preliminary. That's the rudest of, this, of explanations of how, to, how estate and gift taxation both work together and, um, you know, accumulate. Now, what goes into your taxable estate when you die? More than most people think. Can I just drink this? Um, and if you pull out that sheet that says, basic estate, estate taxation. Your gross estate, and, and I have in a parenthesis here, what gets estate taxed is what the IRS says are real transfers of economic benefit. If the economic benefit is going when you die, regardless of what form title is held in, if the real economic benefit is passing at that minute, then it's going to count for estate taxation. So what's in it? Well, for starters, your probate estate, i.e., everything that's in that funnel. Everything that went into that funnel, or I should say, not went into it, came out of it. Everything that came out of the bottom of that funnel is in your, in your gross taxable estate. What else is in it? Ah, joint tenancies. And if it's a joint tenancy, even though legal title passes by operation of law to the surviving joint tenant, they say, well, we are going to say, if you were married, if it, go, you know, if it goes to your spouse, we are going to include one half of it in there by fiat. If you're not married to the joint tenant, i.e., it's a parent and a child who are joint tenants, it is fully includable, the value is fully includable in the estate of the first to die to, extent, to the extent that the survivor cannot prove contribution. So, for example, my mother and I are joint tenants on her automobile. If I died first, it would be presumptively fully included, the value would be fully includable in the estate, in my estate, to the extent my mother cannot prove she paid for it. Well, she can prove she paid for it, so it would come out of my, it would, it would go back out of my estate. But it starts out fully includable in the estate of the first to die, which is why you keep very good records. You want to have that record. Does this get you to your question? Okay. So if it's marital, half of it's going to be includable by fiat. Congress said so. Doesn't matter who paid for it. But if it's a non-marital one, fully includable in the estate of first to die. The basis implications, we're talking income tax basis. Whatever percentage is includable in the decedent's taxable estate gets a stepped up basis. So this is, think back to what I said before. If it gets includable in your taxable estate, which you might say, well, that's bad. <laughs> but if you're under $2 million total, you don't care if it's includable because you're not going to have to pay a tax on it. If it's includable, 
uh, and the tax, I should leave it this way, if it's includable debt going down in your taxable estate, the good thing is the survivor gets a stepped up basis. If it's not includable in your taxable estate, then the survivor has to take over your basis. I mean, then the person who gets it has to take over your basis. So the good thing about it having it includable is that if it's includable, it gets a stepped up basis. The bad thing is, well, it adds to the tax on the decedent's death. But if you haven't reached, reached the $2 million mark, so what? Is that making sense? OK, so what's in there? Probate estate, joint tenancies with this little ex, you know, sub explanation of it. Third, any property over, whom, over which you've got a general power of appointment. Those of you who are the beneficiaries of trusts already or have a general power of appointment over it, know what I'm talking about. Those of you who don't, if you want to talk about it someday, just send me an email. But if you've got a general power of appointment, i.e. the power of you being the decedent, the decedent had the power to appoint it to his own estate or to take it himself, then the IRS is going to say, hey, you had all those strings to that property up until the minute you died. That real transfer of economic benefit didn't happen until you died, so we're going to include it in your taxable estate. Uh, the second, D, what's includable in your, also includable in your taxable estate as distinguished from your probate estate? Life insurance. So long as you possess any of the incidents of ownership, i.e., the right to change the beneficiary, get the cash surrender value, take a loan out on it. Just another example. I have double or I guess I've got triple life insurance benefits through BU. I don't own that policy. My children own it. It's not going to be it's not going to be tax included in my taxable estate at all because my children own the right. I I transferred my rights under those policies completely to them the minute I bought them. What's the point? I'm never going to enjoy it because it's not payable till I die. They're the only ones who are going to enjoy it. Fine, own it. So that's what I did with it. So a lot of people use life insurance as a very valuable tool to move around. Annuities, if you, I'm not going into this, I've got to stop in about two minutes. But annuities, anything you've got with survivorship features in the way of retirement benefits with survivorship features, you have to look very carefully at that because it's very likely to be includable in your taxable estate. And, and lifetime transfers during, any transfers during your lifetime, if you were a beneficiary of it in any way, possession or enjoyment retained, uh, they, that, uh, this is, these are technical, the second one here, and the third one, if you retain the power to alter, amend, revoke or terminate that thing. Now this is where the lady here asked me about living trusts. This is that point. If you've got a living trust that is revocable, everything that's in it, is going to be subject to estate tax. If it's irrevocable and you can cut the cord between you and it, then it won't. OK, you have just had the quickest and dirtiest overview of all of this. I apologize for how much I tried to push at you at once, but I think with this stuff as background, you may be able to sort of make a little more sense out of all that we had to say. Thank you. Professor Miller, thank you very much for being our first presenter at Winterfest. We have a small gift for you <laughs> from the alumni office. We hope that it will come in handy today. Unlike last Winterfest, it's not 65 degrees, so you might actually be able to wear this today. Oh, thank you. We're, we're going to have about a three-minute break before Professor Kotlikoff begins his session as a technician set up for his talk. So we'll be with you in just a second. Once again, thank you so much, Professor Miller. OK. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Lawrence Kutlikoff. I hope you'll all look at uh, his background as printed in the uh, flyer for this event. Uh, it's very impressive. I, I'm going to say a few things to supplement those, those comments. All of them good, Larry, I must say. But, okay. uh, uh, he has been associated with our uh, Department of Economics for 23 years and has just stepped down in the last year as chairman of the department. And I mention that because the department's prominence, uh, its reputation, and its national standing are a direct result of uh, 
Professor Kutlikoff's work over more than a decade as chair, am I correct? Two different stints, and they were each less than a decade, but okay. by a fair amount. Okay, but um, yeah. uh, he has played a major hand in shaping uh, what is one of BU's finest departments. Um, Professor Kutlikoff also is, uh, I, I think the term is a public intellectual. Uh, he has uh, publications uh, that appear on op-ed pages on a regular basis. Perhaps some of you are familiar with his last book, The Coming Generational Storm, which deals with, among other things, the uh, impact of our present Social Security program and uh, some of the bleak implications unless some changes are made. Um, and I will also mention uh, uh, that the title of this talk has changed slightly. It is now Spend to the End Economics Guide to Your Financial Health. And that also happens to be the title of a book that Professor Kutlikoff is in the process of writing. So without further ado, I present Professor Larry Kutlikoff. Thanks, Gene. It's a great pleasure to be with you here. Uh, great idea to come spend your Saturday morning thinking about financial planning. What, what could be more fun? <laughs> it sounds like a joke, but actually I'm somewhat serious. I'm going to try and persuade you through the course of the next 45 minutes that financial planning can actually be financial planning, that it actually can be fun because there can be some real payoffs uh, in terms of your ability to raise your living standard and also to make uh, decisions about your lifestyle in an intelligent way to try and price out in terms of your living standard certain lifestyle decisions, whether it's to uh, get uh, to retire early or to um, uh, buy an expensive sailboat or have another child or more personal things like uh, getting married or whether it makes sense financially to get divorced. Uh, these are all decisions that can be examined uh, using economics and uh, they can all be examined in terms of your living standard, what it means to have an extra child with respect to your living standard, what does it mean to retire a year or two early with respect to your living standard, or, or to get divorced, uh, or to get married. Is it worth it to get married? You know, you give up uh, your freedom on the one hand, and on the other hand you uh, may uh, get some other uh, benefits of being married, but also have a higher living standard for a variety of different reasons uh, that can be examined. So. I'm going to take you through um, uh, a discussion of what economics uh, as a science has to say about financial planning and try and contrast that with what conventional financial planning is, is doing. And I'm going to try and persuade you that there's a big difference between the two approaches, that economics has one approach and conventional financial planning has another approach, and that the two pro approaches are actually not at all uh, connected with each other. The, the one approach uh, we think is, uh, is, the, is getting to the right answer, and the other approach is actually getting to the wrong answer from the perspective of economics. So I'm going to suggest to you that conventional financial planning is actually bad for your financial health. There's an article on uh, my website and on my company's website at esplanner.com, which is uh, posted under research, and, it, and the title of the article is, is Conventional Financial Planning Good for Your Financial Health? And the, an, and the answer uh, that I'm going to persuade you, uh, try to persuade you of today is, is the answer is no, for I think some solid reasons. So you want to be careful about um, the kind of financial planning you're doing and uh, the kind of financial planning advice you're you're, uh, you're getting and, and paying for in many cases. But let me uh, kind of walk you through the, through the argument. Uh, and uh, I want to start out by pointing out that uh, everybody really uh, is uh, in need of financial planning assistance. We're all kind of pulling out our hair, which is uh, this, this, in this picture, when it comes to financial planning, because it's an incredibly complicated problem. Uh, that uh, needs some very sophisticated uh, computer software and, and hardware really to, to solve and to deal with, and we're all being kind of left uh, to try and solve these problems on our own, at least up till now. Now what's the goal of uh, 
according to economics of uh, financial planning. Well, it's what we call consumption smoothing. And this proposition that people are trying to achieve a smooth and stable living standard goes back to uh, the early uh, 1900s when a uh, famous economist named Irving Fisher, the most famous, famous economist of his day, a Yale economist, uh, generated the first real analysis of what it is to optimally consume and save. Uh, and that was the first real study of um, financial planning. And he really uh, began the, uh, the analysis of what's now called the life cycle model of saving. Uh, and that life cycle model has uh, generated several different Nobel Prizes in economics. One, a very direct Nobel Prize to Franco Mendigliani, who was a professor of economics at MIT. And uh, there's been some other prizes in the area of, uh, of finance, which are really very much connected to life cycle theory. Now, the idea of consumption smoothing is to have a stable living standard. And you see that in the blue line. That requires some doing because our earnings, our income, can be very variable. Uh, we can have uh, you know, a, a job where our earnings are growing through time. We may decide to work for a while and then plan to be going back to school for a couple years and then have an even higher level of earnings. So our earnings are kind of moving around through time. We also are hit by different shocks to our earnings, things that we didn't expect. And then we have certain kind of negative income, off the top expenses that we have to pay, whether it's private school for, the, for, uh, for our children if they're going to private school, whether it's paying for an au pair, whether it's paying off a mortgage, whether it's paying for college tuition. These are kind of off the top special expenditures that are really a act like negative income in terms of what, uh, what's going to our, what's happening to our uh, income profile. And then there's also taxes which reduce our income profile and benefits from Social Security and other government uh, sources uh, through time that uh, uh, make our earnings very variable. Now, I have a nine-year-old, and he's actually having his birthday party today. After, after this uh, event, I'm going to go and uh, uh, help run that with my wife at the uh, local karate um, the training center. He's going to do a little a little karate party with his friends. And uh, I wanted to see what kind of an economics man he, he was about, uh, about a year ago. So I did a little experiment with David, which is I went to uh, the local bakery and bought about 25 of the, of the cupcakes that he most loves in the world. And I put them all out on a plate, and I said, David, I did this around 3 in the afternoon when he was pretty hungry. I said, David, have as many cupcakes as you'd like. Eat just as many as you'd like. You can eat all 25 if you'd like. 24, 25. Eat them all if you want. Because, uh, you know, I just went uh, shopping, and uh, uh, I don't go, that, go shopping that often. And, you know, mom's probably going to be going shopping next. So your, uh, your cupcake income is high right now. In the future, it's low. Uh, so dig in. So you didn't wait a second. You know, like in one nanosecond, he had uh, inhaled the first cupcake. The second cupcake went down almost as quickly. So I was observing very carefully. The third cupcake went down a little bit more slowly. The fourth cupcake, he was just nibbling on. I'm sitting there saying, well, you know, David, there's lots of more cupcakes. Uh, how you doing? You, you want to have, you know, after you have this one, do you want to have another one? He said, Dad, let's save the, other, the rest for tomorrow, is the way he put it. Now, what's going on there? Well, what he's experiencing is marginal, uh, is, the, is what we call diminishing returns. Uh, his marginal utility for an additional cupcake after he's had four is very low. But he realizes that tomorrow, his marginal utility for a cupcake, uh, when he's had initially when he's had no cupcakes uh, starting tomorrow, will be higher than his margin utility for an extra cupcake today. So what he wants to do is try and reallocate some of his cupcakes to tomorrow. 
And that's the basis for consumption smoothing. The idea of trying to make your happiness, your utility, is what we economists call it, as high as possible. And the way that, to do that is always to figure out whether to take that last cupcake and eat it now or to allocate it till tomorrow. The same thing with our, our earnings, our income. Should we spend it today on current consumption or should we save it and allocate it to future consumption? So diminishing returns, which is an intuitive concept, I believe, uh, underlies why we want to uh, uh, save some of our resources for the future. Uh, and uh, in this case, we're smoothing our consumption and taking into account the fact that our, that our income in the future will not necessarily be as high as it is today. In the case of David, he realized that his mom was going to go shop, you know, my wife was going to go shopping next, and therefore his cupcake income was not going to be uh, in the future what it, what it was uh, today. So consumption smoothing is about saving to, to kind of equalize that last uh, bit of happiness across these different time periods when you're alive now and in the future. But it's also about trying to ensure yourself uh, across different uh, what we call states of nature, situations where things happen. And I'm talking about a situation where your house burns down or where it doesn't burn down. Those are different states of nature. Or where the stock market does really well or does really poorly. Or you have a big medical expense and you don't. Those are different states of nature. So we're buying insurance to really try and make sure that our cupcake consumption is the same in all these different states of nature. That's what insurance is all about, trying to smooth our living standard across states of nature, not just across time. That's what savings about. But insurance is about smoothing it across states of nature. Diversification is a kind of form of insurance because you're trying to here smooth your consumption across different states of nature where they are distinguished by the kinds of returns that uh, are being generated by the financial market. So diversification is to try and make sure that if the stock market does really poorly, you're not just holding stock because in that state of nature, the way to insure yourself against that outcome is to, to not just hold stock, uh, not be uh, in a position just, to, just with a stock portfolio at that point. Now, what does tra uh, traditional financial advice involve? Well. The first thing that happens when you go to a financial uh, planner is the financial planner will ask you to set a target for how much you want to spend in the future in retirement and how much you want your survivors to spend if you uh, were to pass away. And if you go to a financial planning uh, website, uh, one of the big investment companies, the first thing that you'll kind of see is uh, a choice to set your spending target, or they may uh, just take a look at your current earnings, ask you what your current earnings are, and, and automatically set a target for you. So the idea of traditional financial planning is that uh, you really have to plan for yourself by setting your own targets, your own spending targets. Now, the problem with this is that if you set a target that's higher than uh, what's consistent with having a smooth living standard, then you're going to set a target that's too high. And therefore, when you're young, you're going to have to spend less than is consistent with a smooth living standard in order to spend more too much when you're old. So you're going to have a living standard that's down here when you're young and one that's up here when you're old. You're going to, get, uh, you're going to end up with consumption disruption rather than consumption smoothing. If you set a target that's too low, You'll be in, induced to uh, consume too much, to spend too much when you're young. And then when you hit retirement, your living standard will drop. Again, that's the opposite of consumption smoothing. So forcing people to set their own targets is, is setting them up to, make, to, to set the wrong target, to come up with uh, the wrong uh, amount to save. Because uh, once you set this target at the wrong level, then you're induced or, or advised to save the wrong amount. So that's uh, going to lead to consumption disruption, not consumption smoothing. So this, screen, this uh, slide says that life is too short for target practice. Small targeting mistakes lead to huge saving insurance and investment mistakes. It turns out that, that uh, 
advice here is really super sensitive to uh, what target you set. If you set even a, a target that's off the mark by just 10%, you're making that targeting mistake for 40 years. If you're thinking about retiring at 60, your maximum age of life, and you really have to think about your maximum age of life rather than your life expectancy as your planning horizon because you may make it that long into the future, you may live that long. Well, your maximum age of life is, for most people, around 100. And uh, here it is, your age, you're thinking about retiring at 60, so that's 40 years. So making a 10% mistake for 40 years adds up. So even small targeting mistakes of an order of magnitude of 10, 15% can lead to huge uh, mistakes in what you're advised to, uh, to save and how much insurance you're told to buy and how, much, uh, and how you're told to invest your assets. So this picture kind of summarizes this point about consumption disruption. If you set your spending target too low down here, well, that means that you're going to be advised to save too little, and that means uh, that you're, in effect, being told to spend too much when you're young. So you spend up there, in order, and then you hit retirement, and all of a sudden, you kind of fall off the, the cliff. Exactly what you probably didn't want to do. You probably didn't want to uh, come and hit retirement. If you went to a financial planner or if you went to a website, you didn't want to, uh, you're probably concerned about falling off a cliff in retirement, so you don't want this to happen, and by doing exactly what the financial planner or the investment company advised, this is exactly where you ended up. So a 10% mistake can lead to a, something like a 20, 30%, actually more like a 30% disruption in your living standard at retirement. The same thing happens when you uh, are told to set the target too high. Well, here again, 10% mistake can lead to about a 30% uh, consumption disruption. Now, a lot of people would say, well, gee, this is not actually too bad a picture because the other, on the other, the other picture is troubling because I don't want to see my living standard decline, but I, if I save a whole lot, if I save too much and my living standard goes up, well, that's not the worst thing in the world. Yes and no. It's true that if you actually do make it to retirement and you do make it, you know, you, you live all these years, uh, then this will have turned out to uh, have been not so terrible a uh, outcome, perhaps, that you would have, uh, uh, in effect, uh, you know, lived at such a low living standard relative to retirement. But what happens if you have uh, saved uh, this additional amount limited your, your living standard, and you die at age 70. You will have squandered your youth rather than your money, is what will have happened. So saving too much is risky, just like saving too little is risky. We're trying to find a happy medium. If saving too much was never a bad thing, then we should all be starving today in order to save every single penny. But we don't do that. That doesn't make sense either. So we're trying to maximize our happiness, our expected happiness, because we're not sure what's going to happen, over all our future dates. So we have to think about our, our current, our present, and what's going to happen 10 years from now, 11 years from now, but also in the distant future. We have all these selves we have to think about and we have to take care of. We're the fiduciary for all those selves. And making one, our early selves, uh, basically sacrifice to, an ex to a uh, in order to an amount, extent, uh, in order to make our future selves uh, that much better off, well, that's not the solution either, because our future selves may not materialize. Things might happen that uh, lead us to uh, die early. So what happens is that many of the investment companies that are out there trying to sell mutual funds and insurance policies and uh, uh, of different uh, kinds are keen on making sales. Let's face it, they're in the business of trying to make money, right? So they have an incentive to tell you to save too much and to insure too much, to buy too much insurance because it helps their bottom line. So when you go to uh, some of these websites, I'm not going to name names, but uh, almost any of the major 
investment companies that you can think of. You go to their website, you're going to find a calculator, and it's going to assume a, a replacement rate for your uh, retirement spending, retirement spending as a share of your income right before retirement of somewhere between 75 and 85 percent. Now this uh, replacement rate for most households is really uh, far too high. For other households it's probably far too low. But for, I think for the majority, my sense is that for the majority of households the industry is uh, suggesting replacement rates that are way out of line and this is uh, really inducing people to set targets that are not 10 percent too high in retirement but but more like 30, 40, 50 percent too high. I mean huge mistakes in the targeting and they do this under the name you know quick plan or quick calculator or or easy plan so what they're doing is they're asking you maybe three or four or five questions maybe ten questions and these are questions that you can answer within the course of about a minute. And then they're giving you advice. This is akin to going to a doctor and having a one minute checkup. That doctor would be kicked out of the profession in about five seconds uh, by the medical community. But in, the, in this arena, it's quite all right for, quote, financial professionals to give people financial checkups that take less than a minute. Well, it's not a uh, healthy thing to, uh, uh, to be subjected to because when you're told to save too much, you say to yourself, well, gee, can I really cut my spending right now in order to save, uh, to hit this target that's, that seems really high? Now I'm, um, now I'm not having fun. Now financial planning becomes a real scary proposition. And then these websites say, well, gee, we can help you hit this target. Let us suggest some portfolios that may raise the probability, that will raise the probability of your hitting this target that's too high. And what goes on then is that uh, the users of these websites are induced to invest in riskier securities, in more in equities and less, less in bonds. And the companies then will collect more higher fees because in general if a mutual fund company is selling equity funds they collect higher fees on those funds than on bond funds. So what happens then is that the individual is told to set the target here. It really should be much lower but he's being told it's here. He believes that story. Then he sees that the probability of making that target given, given his investments or her investments is quite low. Then he is told, well, gee, switch your portfolio towards more equities and you'll, you can raise your probability. And that's all true. You can raise your probability significantly of hitting the target. But you can also, if you do that, substantially uh, worsen the downside. And these websites don't show you the downside. They don't show you the variability of your living standard if you follow those particular um, uh, actions. So I refer to this as uh, soliciting risk. This is, uh, um, I think, part and parcel of the general financial malpractice that's being uh, perpetrated on the American public right now by the uh, investment companies and to some extent the financial planners, not that these, all the individuals in, these, uh, industri in this industry and the individual financial planners are intentionally trying to engage in any malpractice or really trying to, uh, they may have the best intentions. I think most of them do have very good intentions. It's not for many people just about making money. Even the top executives in these big companies aren't just into it for making money. But the tools they're using are like you know, 18th century medicine. There was no penicillin back there, and uh, no Novocaine, all kinds of things that uh, we have today uh, didn't exist back then. But what would it mean for somebody to try and uh, 
you know, treat an infection without an antibiotic today, well, they, again, that would not be acceptable to the medical community. We have the, t the ability today, given advances in economics, given advances in c computer software and in computer hardware, the ability to avoid uh, giving this kind of bad advice. We can actually give people a proper advice. And uh, that's where economics uh, has something to offer here. And I'm going to uh, tell you now about a software product that I developed called Economic Security Planner. It's called uh, ES Planner is the short, uh, shortcut for that uh, software. So I'm going to uh, give you some idea of how this software works and what it can do in terms of helping raise uh, your living standard and price out your lifestyle decisions. Uh, and this may all sound like a um, long ad advertisement for our software, but it's really an advertisement for economics because although this is the first uh, and only at this point consumption smoothing program that's commercially available on the market, economists in their research are generating consumption smoothing programs every day of the week and have been for, for decades now. It's really uh, finally come to the point where the, the uh, computers run fast enough that we can actually uh, bring some of the benefits from our research to the, to the public. We can actually, uh, as economists, uh, as academics, uh, move from just uh, diagnosing problems and seeing problems and researching problems to actually prescribing solutions. And uh, this is the, I think, first step in that direction, the software. But I imagine that over time, other consumption smoothing programs will come onto the market. So I'm, we think of this as a revolution in financial planning. I, I think it's a fair, a fair statement. Uh, so, so in thinking about what I'm going to say now, don't think about this as really uh, uh, just uh, a discussion of this particular product. Think about this as um, a discussion of economic security. The, the title of the software is Economic Security Planner. Think about economic as in economics, as in the profession of economics having something to say about this problem. Now, what does uh, this software do? Well, it finds the targets for you. So rather than ask you right off the bat, what do you want to spend in retirement, and what, you do, what do you want your survivors to spend, the software says, look, I'm not going to ask you that question at all. Just tell us. Tell me, I'm speaking now as the software, tell me what you're earning this year, what your assets are, what your retirement accounts are, what you're going to be contributing, what you're going to be earning in the future, what your self-employment income is, what your mortgage is, what, um, what special expenditures you have to make. Basic questions like this that are very simple for anybody to answer is what the, the software asks you. And then you hit a button called Create Reports. and about eight, 10 seconds later, you're told how much to spend every year on consumption such that your living standard will be perfectly smooth uh, if, if uh, indeed that doesn't entail your uh, having to go into debt to have a perfectly smooth living standard. That's a topic I'll come back to in a second. But the software says, OK, here's how much you should spend every year to maintain a smooth living standard. And by living standard, I don't mean just the total amount you have, you're told to spend in a given year on consumption. I mean the living standard per adult living in the household. If there are more people living in the household, there are kids at home, if you're married, you're going to have to spend more money because there are more mouths to feed to give everybody the same living standard per person, right? So the recommendation from the software, when the kids are at home, is to spend up here when the kids are at home. When they start to leave, you drop down your spending, the total spending. Uh, but the underlying living standard per person is being held constant. And the software is taking into account economies in shared living, the fact that two can live more cheaply than one, and the fact that kids are not necessarily as expensive as adults in uh, maintaining a living standard. So the software is implementing consumption smoothing, again, in about eight seconds. 
It's fully integrated in the sense that it deals with saving and insurance and portfolio issues uh, simultaneously. It deals with borrowing constraints. The fact that uh, uh, this, this turns, because of borrowing constraints and, and the complexities of the tax system and the social security system and other issues, it turns out to be a pretty complicated mathematical problem to solve, but not insolvable by any means. So what are borrowing constraints? Well, borrowing constraints are the inability to go into debt beyond your mortgage. You may not want to borrow in order to have a perfectly smooth living standard. You may be willing to uh, forgo, or you may be unable to borrow to have a perfectly smooth living standard. You may, for example, put a whole lot of money into your 401k, and you can't borrow against that, and you may have a big mortgage to pay off and kids to send through college. So your living standard before your kids get out of the college and before the mortgage is paid off is going to be down here, and then it's going to be up here after, reach, after, that, after you get out from under that, uh, those expenses. So what you have then is two consumption smoothing problems. You've got a smoother living standard before you uh, get out from under those expenses and then thereafter. And the software is automatically doing that. It's, it's uh, dealing with these different intervals or, under, during which you're uh, what we call barn constrained or cash constrained or, or uh, there are different words for it, liquidity constrained. So the idea here then is to smooth, smooth your living standard to the maximum extent possible and that's what the software does. And to do that, you need to use a mathematical technique called dynamic programming. And then you also want to be able to do things like plan for contingencies. What happens if, uh, if the husband should die, or let's say the wife should die, she's the principal earner, and the husband uh, uh, is also working, but there's a couple small kids at home, so they have to hire, uh, the husband would have to hire an au pair. So you want to be able to plan for contingencies and tell the a tell software program, gee, in thinking about how much life insurance I need, I want you, the software program, to know that if my wife passes away, I'm going to have to hire an au pair because that's going to be very expensive and I'm going to need some more life insurance on her because of that requirement that I hire an au pair if she passes away. Monte Carlo simulations are, are showing in the software uh, given what portfolios you tell the, so the software you're going to be holding through time, they're showing you the variability of your living standard. So it's a whole different picture of risk and return than exists in the, uh, out there in the marketplace in terms of what you will find on a traditional financial planning investment company website. Uh, here we're talking about kind of the level of your living standard and as you age through time, the variability, the spread of your living standard the percentile distribution of your living standard. So that's um, what this software is looking at. Now, the software not only in, in a few seconds will tell you how, to, how you can optimally smooth your living standard, but it also tell you, help you figure out how to raise your living standard. Let me give you some examples of that. Think about putting more money into a 401k. So maybe your, so the median age in this room is about, let me take a look about 40. All right. All right, 38. <laughs> yeah. So all you 38-year-olds are sitting there making some contributions perhaps to IRAs or Roth IRAs or maybe 401k Roths or regular 401ks or 403bs if you work in a university or, or a nonprofit institution. And you have to say to yourself, gee, am I putting enough money into these accounts? Or am I putting in too much? Uh, what's, the, what's the advantage to me? So why not have a program that can uh, tell you, okay, here's your living standard given what, you're, given, given what you're currently contributing and what you expect to contribute through time, and allow you uh, to say, to figure out in, in a few seconds, if I contribute more, maybe an extra uh, 500 bucks a year or 1,000 bucks or 2,000 bucks a year, how much my living standard will go up or down as a result of that. Now, the reason it would likely go up is that uh, you're likely going to be in a higher tax bracket now than you are going to be in the future when you take the money out. So by putting more money into a deductible retirement account, like a regular four IRA or a 401k, you can lower your taxes now. You'll have to raise them uh, to be higher in the future, but on balance, you may end up with a higher living standard. 
And this is not something that you should be forced to figure out on your own. The, the software should do it, and it actually can do it very, very quickly. In eight seconds, you can find out the answer to how much that would raise your living standard. And if it raises your living standard, you could say, well, maybe I want to do a little bit more of it. Uh, there's some reasons not to, 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 or to be worried that you, this could actually lower your living standard. One, one possibility is that in the future, the government's going to raise taxes. And I think that's likely to be the case because this government is, our government is, is really essentially bankrupt when you look at all the long-term liabilities that the country's facing. And I don't say that lightly. That's a very strong word. But I spent a lot of years uh, studying this problem. Other economists have as well. Ben Bernanke, the head of the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, was speaking about that yesterday uh, to the Senate uh, Budget Committee, I believe. These are serious problems that we're facing as a nation. And the government's likely to raise taxes. So here you lower your, your current taxes, thinking that you're going to pay taxes in the future, but that they're not going to be that much higher. But what happens if the government raises the tax rates 30, 40, 50 percent just when you're pulling your money out of your 401k account? So it can be a tax trap. The software allows you to, to think about future, uh, taxes uh, being higher in the future. That, a Roth is an alternative. You put your money in now, you don't get a tax deduction, but in the future you don't have to pay any taxes. Uh, that also, there's also interactions of, uh, uh, of your 401k uh, withdrawals with Social Security benefit taxation, because when you, when you uh, take your money from Social Security, well, gee, uh, some of it may be subject to taxation. And the thresholds beyond which your, uh, you know, your taxable, in if your in taxable income is high enough, then your Social Security benefits will be subject to uh, federal income taxation. So you can lose a lot of your Social Security benefits if you uh, get hit by uh, this federal income taxes. So maybe you want to try and time your withdrawals from your retirement account before you take your Social Security benefits because that way, when you take your Social Security benefits, maybe not so much of them will be subject to taxation, federal income taxation. Maybe you want to wait till you're 70 to take Social Security, and maybe take your 401k uh, withdrawals from age 62 to age 70, or 69, and then start at age 70 to get Social Security. Social Security also gives you a fabulous return on waiting to collect. So it's. If you're a 60-year-old household, for example, you're sitting here with our software, we've, we've done run cases where you can find out in a few matter of a, a minute or two, or a few seconds actually, that uh, relative to, for example, taking the 401k late and the Social Security money early, you could do the opposite and raise your living standard every year in the future by 6%, just because of the tax and Social Security benefit provisions. Now, in order to to figure that out, you need to have a program that's doing these calculations with extreme uh, care. And I started this company uh, with some other economists about 13 years ago. And it, we've developed the company over time and improved the product. But it was in part a commercial venture, but in large part a research, inventor, uh, a, a re research uh, mission to try and uh, have a tool that could do very good research on questions of are people saving enough, are they insuring enough, let's analyze some of their portfolio risk. So we needed to have for our research extremely accurate measurements of people's taxes, not just uh, kind of a, an average tax rate that's going to prevail through time, but we had to figure out a program that was going to calculate your taxes at every date in the future and for every survivor contingency. If the husband were to die at 41 and the wife's alive at 73, that's a different survivor state than if the husband dies at 42 and she's alive at, at whatever, 71 or 73. Because what she will have inherited will be different. Uh, the life insurance he would have left her. The Social Security benefits she'll collect as a survivor. All these things will be different. And all these things matter. So you have to sweat this stuff. And many of the companies that are producing software aren't interested in actually the advice they're giving. They're interested in trying to sell you something. So we were interested in the advice our machine was getting because we were doing research with it. Uh, and, uh, and we also wanted to make sure that if we gave advice, it was based on the, on the best knowledge we had about the whole tax uh, Social Security benefit system. So what about pricing, pricing lifestyle decisions? Well, suppose you think you want to have another kid, but you're not sure how much it's going to cost. And you might have to have 
The wife might have to take off for a couple years some work. Well, again, you can see you've got your baseline living standard profile. You set up the program to run it again. You run the program again with an extra kid showing up in two years. And bingo, 10 seconds later, you see that that has lowered your living standard because the wife, you'd also specify the wife is going to be out of the, out of the workforce for a couple of years. So all these decisions uh, can be considered. And you also can see what's happening to your living standard <coughs> risk in terms of your portfolio choices. Let me just show you all the different kinds of, uh, of issues that you can look at with an economic model here with respect to raising your living standard. Choosing your job. You leave BU, you just graduate, you've got the choice between this career and that career. This career's got a high paying job, but there's um, little growth in uh, growth prospects. The other career has a low paying job, but the growth prospects are terrific. Which career is gonna pay you more in terms of being able to generate a higher living standard? Very complicated question. Nobody can figure that question out on, a, on his own unless he's got a Pentium 4, a whole set of Pentium 4 chips implanted in his brain. It's that difficult because just figuring, thinking about all the taxes every year of your future life is uh, extremely complicated. So, but that again is a, t is a 10, eight second question that can be answered. It's selecting a mortgage, should I take one with points and lower payments or one with uh, no points and a higher payments? Again, lots of tax issues there. Again, it's about eight seconds. Increasing your 401k contributions, we talked about that. Converting from a regular IRA to a Roth IRA. Timing your withdrawals from your retirement accounts. Downsizing your home. Will that save me a lot of money if I go and sell my house and rent? Okay, what about moving to Texas, where they don't pay any income taxes? May sound like a good idea, except they have very high property taxes in many of the cities. If you go to Houston, the property tax rate is very high because they don't have an estate income tax. They have to make the, get, get the money somewhere. You have to think about that. So you need a program that allows you to look at the issue of changing your home. And maybe some people change their home more than once. And they have also vacation homes that they may change. So all that has to be included. But again, it doesn't have to be overwhelming. Taking Social Security early or late, taking early retirement, going to college. So what about pricing your lifestyle? Uh, you know, what if you, um, now this is a wacky thing, but I, you know, I'm writing a book with Scott Burns, my co-author in the other book. Uh, he's a, f a financial columnist, a syndicated columnist with the, with the Dallas Morning News. And uh, so I'm writing this chapter, trying to ex get across the idea of, of uh, these lifestyle, pricing your lifestyle choices. So, gee, I said to myself, what's a lifestyle choice? Well, a lifestyle choice is taking a lover. That's, I don't know, that just came to me as something to try and, Get, wake up our readers a little bit. So here you are, and I said, well, should we think about a, a husband taking a lover in this book, or should we have a wife taking a lover? I think we decided, I decided we should talk about a wife taking a lover uh, for, for some reason that, uh, I thought that might go over well with my wife if she ever read the book <laughs> better with my, anyway, so I'm trying to get across the point that you can price out love, that you can put a price tag on love, because that's one of our of our suggestions that people try and price out what they love in terms of uh, their living standard. So here I set up a story where you've got this uh, couple, they're, they're married, the wife has got a lover, and the husband has just found out. And he's telling her, look, you either drop this lover or we're going to get divorced. And the lover's, uh, let's say, unemployed and he's not into marrying. so, so. This person has to realize that her living standard is going to fall if they get divorced by how much? You need, she knows the answer. Suppose it falls by 80%. Well, maybe then she decides it's not worth it. But suppose it only falls by 40%. Maybe she thinks it is worth it. She needs to know exactly how much her living standard was going, is going to fall if she gets divorced, if she takes stays uh, with this lover. So, because there is a point at which she will be indifferent between staying married and getting divorced. And that's the price of her love for this person. And because love is not, we, we don't think about prices as absolutes in economics. We think about them as swap rates. 
rates at which I'm willing to swap this for that. So it might be that at a 53.87% uh, uh, living standard reduction, that that's exactly the price that she's indifferent between staying married and going off with this person and having a reduced living standard. So she suffers a 57% reduction, but she's, uh, you know, uh, well, if, 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 if she were, uh, if that were the cutoff and her actual living standard reduction were, let's say, 50%, then it would make sense for her to actually leave her husband and get divorced. So you really can price out love. You can put a price tag on love. And uh, the problem is we need to make all these kinds of decisions about buying that expensive boat, retiring early, making charitable contributions, giving regular gifts to our kids, staying home with the kids, buying a vacation home, getting divorced, having another kid, selecting a career. All these, these are you know, a low stress career or a high stress career. All these decisions are critical decisions for making us happy, and we're doing it in a vacuum without knowing what things really cost. And now we have the ability to, to make those decisions knowing what things cost. So the software can really answer these questions. I'm just going to zip through. Uh, it deals with the, all the different types of taxes you're facing, things like the alternative minimum tax and the earned income tax credit and the low saver, uh, uh, low saver credit indexation of the tax code, does all the state income taxes in great detail. So only an anal economist could, could really uh, <laughs> do this. Uh, and the Social Security, uh, <laughs> to be quite honest, I mean, it took us six months just to program Social Security because we had to call down to Washington. Every time, every time we tried to figure out uh, a question, it was not specified in the Social Security handbook, which has, by the way, 2,528 rules, separate rules, detailed rules. And after you read all those rules, you still find that there's all kinds of complexity that's not revealed in that. And there's only a couple uh, old folks in the Social Security. They have a massive building in Baltimore. There's only a couple old, old timers who still know all the rules because they're not actually written down. They're embedded in the software code that uh, is determining these benefits, but that code was written in, a, in an ancient computer language called COBOL. And nobody down in Social Security Action in Baltimore actually reads that code anymore. So we have a black box, literally, that's generating benefits. And uh, as far as I understand, that's what the actuaries told me as of a couple years ago was going on. And uh, anyway, so we did find a few of these people that are still there <laughs> who knew the uh, knew what that code was generating. And we looked at all these different issues, the earnings test, the delayed retirement credit, early earnings, you know, how to deal with the early retirement reduction, recomputation of benefits, family benefit maximum, windfall, windfall elimination provision, offset provisions, which apply to people that haven't, that have been working for, for state governments or in the military that aren't covered, uh, haven't been covered by Social Security. And what order do you, it's one thing to figure out what each of these things, how to program each of these things, but also how to order them. What, what order should they occur? Uh, uh, how, how should you order them in your program? So here's the summary. Financial pl planning really is rocket science. Rules of thumb are rules of dumb, <laughs> such as you know, uh, target for a 75% replacement rate, something like that. That's really a rule of dumb. And bad advice is worse than no advice, I believe. Now, I, um, I can spend a minute or two uh, with you if you have the time to show you, just to give you kind of a very quick glimpse of what the software looks like. But uh, I'll, this will only take just like one or two minutes, just so you can see that um, so I've just set up here a family, Joe and uh, Sally Smith, and they've got a couple kids. And uh, they have some uh, different inputs. I'm not going to take you through all the different screens, but there's like earnings and, and assets. They've got some assets, and they've got some uh, retirement account money and some future contributions, things of this nature. And then you generate some reports, and the reports show you that, uh, well, I'll just show you right here. Let me push this to the top. That
you can see that their uh, living standard, uh, their consumption, recommended consumption, and all the numbers in today's dollars is about $53,000 until they hit uh, 2019 when the first child leaves the household, then it drops down to 45,000, then it's down to 37,000 when the uh, second child leaves the household. The underlying living standard for this particular household, 23,361, is the same throughout life. So that's the uh, connection between consumption and uh, living standard. And consumption here refers to all the spending apart from housing and off the top special expenditures and taxes and 401k contributions. And then there's also recommended term life insurance that you see. So these are the kind of basic re recommendations and here's how much the household needs to save every year in today's dollars. So you get these kinds of recommendations and then you can, um, after you've run that particular case, then you can run other cases which, uh, for example, Sally contributes to an IRA. Well, what does that do to the household's living standard? Well, you just run it again. You see, well, gee, let's look at the annual recommendations. Oh, I must have done something else. Let's see. Well, that's a much higher living standard, but uh, I, think there was, I think there was something else that I did uh, in between. So well, I, let's ignore that run. I think I modified this uh, particular input. Uh, but I, as I recall, having her contribute about 2000 bucks a year raised her living standard by about uh, a half a percent every year the rest of their lives. That only took me about eight, 10 seconds to figure out, just to try it. So this is a, a way, this is why I tried to say at the beginning that fin financial planning can be fun, because what could be more fun than spending a minute and really having some confidence that you can actually raise your living standard and it not having cost you anything? What could be more fun than, than figuring out in a few seconds that taking Social Security late and taking your retirement account money early can actually lower your taxes and raise your living center. So that's the, uh, the hope here, that, so, that financial planning will turn into financial planning. It would actually be fun, and that uh, economics will go from just describing problems to actually prescribing solutions for the American public. So let me start, stop there and uh, welcome any questions that you have. Yes? How would you handle any uh, updates, in other words, changes to well, we're updating the software on an ongoing basis. So we have update, our software uh, comes with a, a license to, to, for free updates for a year, and then you pay $50 to get the next year's of free updates. And, and we're adding new features and uh, new code all the time that takes that into account. So basically, you'd buy the software and you'd have it like loaded to your PC versus doing it online? Yeah. It's, uh, it would be loaded to your uh, to PC. It's a PC-based uh, program at this point. By the way, I should point out, I should have pointed out early on that this is a, um, in part, a Boston University company in the sense that Boston University invested in the company back uh, about a decade ago, a small amount of money, and they have a small equity stake. But it's, uh, it's something that uh, the university has supported. And indeed, all the, all the employees of Boston University have, have free access to the software. I mean, the university pays us a a modest license fee, and they, all the uh, employees and uh, faculty and staff all have access and can download it at any point. Yes? Uh, State of Massachusetts Treasurer Cahill yes. has this really fancy uh, kind of financial planning and, and deferred compensation and all of that. Um, how, how much does, does he know or not know? I mean, should we be taking his suggestions or following in the footsteps of what he's recommending? It's hard to, hard for, I don't want to comment on him particular because I don't know his, what exactly he's doing, but as a rule, uh, I would, the, the, uh, the industry as a rule is doing what I said. They're asking you to set your own target and that is very dangerous because you can easily set your target too high or too low. Do you know exactly what your taxes are going to be when you're 68, when you're 69, when you're 70? Do you have any way of, think about all the issues involved with just your federal income taxes. Maybe you're still going to be working at that point. Think about the FICA taxes. Maybe you'll be self-employed. Or maybe you'll be selling your home that year. Think about the capital gains treatment of your, ta your house. All that stuff is not something that you should have to worry about. When you go to a doctor and you've got a, uh, 
a, uh, you know, infection, the doctor doesn't ask you to tell him what medicine he thinks you should use, nor does he ask you to kind of make that medicine well, on your own. The basis for the yeah. question is Treasurer Cahill says, do this. He's former, yes. former Treasurer Cahill, right? He's not currently, he's, he's is he currently a treasurer? Yeah, he is. Yeah. So he has a little job on this, a company on the side that? Could be. Oh yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> let's leave him off the hook because we, we don't know exactly what he's doing and he may be doing something that's really first rate and outstanding and really helping people and I'm sure without knowing anything about him, he's a public, fine public servant is my yeah. presumption. So let's assume, let's bless him <laughs> to the extent we can. But let me just indict the industry in general. Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, there's a so website called esplanner.com, and uh, you just go there and register and then click purchase. Yes. It's we have people. It's really designed for anybody to use because. It, we're, we're basically at this point selling it to thousands of individuals from all walks of life. We have people that are, uh, you know, had a high school graduation, education, others who are making $7 million a year trading bonds for Morgan Stanley. So it's just a huge range of people that are using the software. Well, the program is going to, uh, it won't actually, it'll give you advice, recommendations, but it won't actually. You put in your inputs, your basic, you know, you know your mortgage, you know your property taxes, so things. In, uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, things, the questions that are being asked are very straightforward. No. No, but if you, but it doesn't ask you whether you want to travel around the world, but allows you to specify under special expenditures that you're going to make a, um, a trip, an expensive trip for, trip for one year for uh, you know, a certain amount of money. So for example, right here, you can specify a different, uh, you know, whatever special expenditures you want, and it will take that into account. Yes? You mean the, the timing of paying your capital gains taxes? Well, there are things you can do in the software. And part of the service that we provide is to help people if they have questions in using our software. We provide a lot of service in terms of getting on the phone with people and saying, okay, you've got a special problem here or a special issue. Here's how we think it would be best inputted. So that's, so you could give me a call. You know, my cell phone is on the website. The software is, is $149, the basic program, and the, the version that has these Monte Carlo simulations that show you the variability of your living standard, that's $199. I, I forgot, to, I wanted to show you one picture of that, if you could just indulge me for one second longer. I'm obviously pretty en enthused about this. <laughs> kind of like Steve Jobs here. I think uh, maybe a little bit over, over the top. But um, so here's a guy named Joe Blow. And uh, this is the kind of picture that I think will evolve through time in thinking about, look at this top picture, which is showing you the level of Joe's living standard, and then as he ages, the spread of his living standard. And the, the dots on the lower curve are uh, the, the fifth lowest percentile of his living standard, and the top curve is the 95th, and we've got the 25th and 75th and 50th in there. And what this is saying is that Joe can, um, can say, well, gee, if I invest in these, this particular set of securities, 20 years from now, 5% of the time, my living standard is going to be here or below. Whereas the alternative might be to invest, I can run this thing again, investing in something much safer like 
inflation index bonds, which are called TIPS, Treasury uh, Inflation Protected Securities. And yeah, I won't have as much upside, but I won't also have this much downside. So that's the way that people can think about what portfolios they want to hold, by focusing in on what's really critical, which is the living standard risk, not the portfolio risk. You could have somebody that, take somebody who's very poor, who's living basically off of Social Security and maybe has $50,000 and he's 65, he's retired. And you might say it's absolutely nuts for this person to, re to invest in, uh, in equities, just that, you know, $50,000 because he's poor. Well, it's not absolutely nuts, nuts because he has very little downside risk because the Social Security benefit that he's going to get is protected against inflation, is going to continue until he dies. He's also going to Medicare. So, and let's suppose he also has, uh, you know, a, a, uh, uh, a major medical policy. Let's, so let's hold medical risk to the side. Well, this person really has very little downside risk in terms of his living standard. If he loses all his $50,000, it's not going to matter much to his living standard. What if this person had $5 million and just Social Security? $5 million plus Social Security. Well, that person then has a lots of living standard risk if he invests in equities. So for this poor person, it makes more, much more sense to invest in equities than for the rich person. So when you bring economics to bear to these questions, you get quite different answers than conventional financial planning is providing. You find out that taking Social Security late might make more sense and taking your, your, withdrawing your 401k account money early might make more sense. You find out that, um, that um, the rich should probably invest in safer assets than the poor because the poor have much more downside protection coming from the government. Let me see if there are any last questions. If not, I want to, yes, one last question. We're updating the tax system on a, the tax code on an ongoing basis. So whenever there's a change in the law, we change the tax uh, code in the program. You just it. Yeah. And then you just go to the website and download the latest update. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.